Okay, so for part two, I'm going to talk about the front part of the eye. That's my specialty is the front part of the eye. My name is Matt Wade. I'm also an assistant clinical professor here, and I don't have any disclosures to give you today or to talk about. Okay, so if you have diabetes, you may notice that from time to time your prescription may change, and it does correlate with when your blood sugar goes up. And you may wonder why when my blood sugars are really high or my, and my vision's blurry and I go to the doctor and they say my prescription's changed. So let's talk about why. So for this, we want to focus on the lens. Now the lens, that big blue arrow is pointing to the lens, and we're going to talk about an enzyme. So an enzyme's like a love seat, you know? A couple comes in, or two people come in, they can, they can sit down in a love seat, they can come out a couple, or vice versa. Uh, things change when you sit down on, on that, either with someone else or maybe with a pint of ice cream, maybe you leave being bigger. The enzyme is the same way. It changes things, and in the lens, you have to understand that when blood sugar goes high, it goes high in the aqueous, which is the fluid inside of the eye. And that fluid then brings glucose to the lens. The lens doesn't have its own vasculature. And so glucose goes, it's the blue circle, glows, goes into the lens cells and is converted via this star, which is the aldose reductase, which is an enzyme, into something called sorbitol. And then sorbitol eventually can be converted into fructose, which can leave the lens cells. But sorbitol itself can't leave the lens cells. So we have a problem here. When the sugars are too high and this pathway becomes activated, we get a lot of sorbitol. And you'll notice that the, I made the stars different sizes, glucose goes to sorbitol at a very rapid rate compared to sorbitol going to fructose. So what does this mean? This means that you have all this sorbitol build up in the lens and uh, it pulls in water. And when it pulls in water, the lens cells swell and the lens itself becomes bigger and so you have a higher power of the lens. So, sh so typically when you have these, these shifts, you have a myopic or nearsighted shift, as you can see here in this picture. So hopefully that helps explain why when your blood sugars are really high, your prescription may be changed. So, and <laughs> This is a joke saying that he needs a little blood sugar to help him read the chart. But it may be the other way around, right? Okay, so not only does this affect uh, your prescription at the time, but chronically over time this can cause a cataract. And the cataract is the lens, it's a change in the lens that you were born with to become, uh, when it was clear like this, and then gradually becomes, can you see the cloudiness there? And then even more so here, this is an advanced cataract. It'd be hard for this person to see anything at all because the light can't, you can't see through the lens and they can't see out through the lens. So medicines have changed a lot. One of the problems we have is all our patients know everything now. So the only edge we have is to get a faster modem and get the answers faster than they do. So we talked about prescription changes. We've talked about uh, how uh, cataracts are formed from diabetes. And I also want to touch on glaucoma. Now, glaucoma causes peripheral vision loss. On the left, you can see this picture here, this beautiful image of the ocean. And on the right, you can see that it's blurred in the periphery. Now, when you have glaucoma, you don't actually just see this black ring around. But you just can't see things in the periphery quite as well as you can centrally. And when we look inside the eye, this is what we see. We see the optic nerve. And on the left here, you see a normal optic nerve. And on the right, you see an increased divot or white spot there. If you imagine the nerve coming from the brain to the eye, and there's a million or so nerve fibers that then spread out to go to the different parts of the retina. When they do so, they leave a divot. And the size of that divot gives us some, some hint as to how many nerve fibers layer, or how many, what, what the thickness of the nerve fiber layer is. So the bigger the divot, the more we get concerned that there is loss of the nerve fiber layer. And you can see again on the right, there's that cupping or larger divot that's associated with glaucoma. So what causes glaucoma? Typically, it's caused by pressure. And I say typically because there are other factors that you can see on the right there. This increased pressure in the eye causes damage to the optic nerve, which is why when you go to the eye doctor, they test your eye pressure. You know, some places they do the puff of air. We typically do other, a little more accurate tests um, so we can get a sense as to what the pressure is. So pressure is made inside the eye in, in the ciliary body here, and then it flows around the iris, and this structure here is the angle. 
the angle is where the drainage happens. You make pressure to keep the eye formed and you drain pressure to keep the pressure not too high. Uh, open angle glaucoma happens when the pressure is too high despite having an open angle. You can see the fluid has access to that angle, but it's not draining out as much as it needs to. Closed angle glaucoma happens when the, the angle itself is closed off. There's no way for the fluid to get there, and so the pressure builds up. And this is particularly dangerous. So with glaucoma, Dr. Mehta talked about how we get new blood vessels. Can you see on this iris, can you see all those red blood vessels that are there? So those aren't supposed to be there. Those are new blood vessels that are formed because that VEGF has been secreted and the body's responding with new blood vessels. And so you can see all those there. Now imagine if you have this, those blood vessels there, what's going on in the angle? And I'll show you a picture of that here. So if you look off into the angle here, you can see those blood vessels are, it's a little bit hard to see, but they're crawling up against that angle. So they're going to eventually contract and pull the iris closed over that angle so that the pressure is going to rise. Now when that happens, typical eye drops don't work. We have to resort to surgery to help lower the pressure. And a lot of this can be uh, thwarted by having laser, like you said, or treating things uh, in advance. So this is a woman who's returning her husband's glasses because they didn't help him see things her way. So my wife has a joke about this. She said, Matt, if I agreed with you, we'd both be wrong. I can't tell if she's right or not. But OK, so let's just talk about a few things in terms of blood glucose. If you're going to have surgery, you may want to know what you do with your blood sugar medications. If you're on oral medications, typically, and I don't want you to do it based on what I'm saying. This is just a general overview. You're going to check with your primary care doctor or your anesthesiologist. They're going to give you more specific recommendations. But if you're on oral pills, you're, you're going to hold them for a day or two before. If you're on insulin, you're going to take half the basal dose. If you take it at night, you'll take it half the dose at night. Or in the morning, you'll take half the dose in the morning. You'll check your blood sugar. Um, and they'll check your blood sugar when you go to surgery. If it's too high, uh, they may cancel your surgery. And if it's, too, if it's way too high, they may send you to the emergency room. Sugar can, blood sugar can rise around the time of surgery from the stress of surgery and from uh, also from just a variable. We can, you, you can even have low blood sugar from the variable amount of food that you've eaten and uh, you know, whether or not you took the correct amount of insulin for that amount of food. Okay, so we want to control our blood sugars, but one thing, you know, if, you, if you're about to go for surgery and you have really high blood sugar, a very rapid change may actually worsen some of the problems that Dr. Mehta talked about. So you want to do so under the, you want to make corrections under the supervision of your primary care doctor. So what we're worried about is really infection after surgery. And infections, there's a picture of a sloth. I want you to remember that the immune cells, the white blood cells, when the sugars are high, they get slowed down. And so they can't get to the, in, the infection site fast enough. And even when they're there, their fighting power is slowed down and, and hampered as well. So that's the problem with high blood sugar and uh, possible infection. This is Moses saying, thou shalt not eat carbs. He's telling God, I'm, I think I'm going to have a hard time selling that one. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what is my particular specialty, which is the cornea. So the cornea is the front window of the eye, the clear window that you look through. You see someone's color, the colored part of the eye through it. And that if you break it down, you have the epithelial cells on the top. There's Bowman's layer, stroma, and then, and then so on and so forth. We're going to talk about those front cells, though. Has anyone ever had a scratch to the eye? You ever scratched your eye? How does it feel? Like, terrible, right? Extremely painful. Well, there are a lot of nerve endings there, and those front cells, when they're missing, it, you feel every single one of those nerve endings. This, you, can you see the, the, the outline there where those front cells are missing? Sometimes it's hard to see just with our own eyes, and so we, we can add some dye, and I'll show you this. Now, do you see, this is a different one, of course, but do you see the spot there? So there's a fluorescein dye, that green area, that lights up when there's missing epithelial cells. And the epithelial cells, uh, in diabetes, when it's uncontrolled, are dysfunctional. They don't anchor as well. They don't heal as fast. Uh, they don't create the same kind of barrier that they typically do. And um, so when you have a wound or a scratch, there's problems in healing. 
And of course, problems in healing uh, are not you know, uncommon in diabetes. Here is a picture of a diabetic foot ulcer, and you can see the problems that they have, that you can have in the periphery uh, healing. And this has to do with a lot of things, damage to the blood vessels, damage to the nerves, so that you have a neuropathy and you can't feel things and you stub your toe uh, or lean on part of your foot and, and then eventually it becomes a, uh, uh, something like this. Now the same thing happens in the eye. And the risk there, of course, is that an infection gets in and you get an ulcer. This is a picture of a corneal ulcer and you can see uh, a layer of white cells inside the eye, that's that layer on the bottom, as well as an infiltrate in the middle, and, and this is a serious condition that, that uh, requires emergent treatment and uh, a lot of work to try to treat. I'd like to buy a vowel patent. So one question people have with diabetes is, and maybe not this crowd, but uh, maybe someone you know, is can you have LASIK? And the answer is uh, typically yes, if your diabetes is well controlled and we're not seeing damage in the back of the eye but it's definitely something you want to bring up to your eye doctor if you're ever considering LASIK. And you have people maybe who complain about having to get a flu shot, but you know, if you're a diabetic on insulin, then they, you know, that's not quite so bad when they're complaining to you. Now, one other thing that diabetes can cause, among many, many other health problems, is actually a palsy. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see that one eye is, is looking forward and the other eye is looking to the side. And that's because the, the vessels that serve the muscle, one of the muscles around the eye, have, have had a problem. And so that muscle isn't working. Now, typically, if it's due from diabetes, it will regrow and it will uh, work again after a few months. If it's due to a stroke or other things, it may not. So there's one picture. There's another drawing of an eye going the wrong way because of small, mess, small vessel damage from diabetes. So we talked about lens changes, cataracts, Neovascular glaucoma, we talked about epithelial cells and uh, how their barrier function and healing time has been diminished with high blood sugar. We talked about how you can have a palsy from high blood sugar. Any other questions that you have about diabetes in the eye? Well, so that's a good question. Controlled and uncontrolled, it really is uh, something that's always under study, basically. They're always doing new trials to say, okay, well, if we get the blood sugar this low, then how few complications can we have? So a better bet is to ask your primary care doctor or your endocrinologist what they want your blood sugars to be at. Um, but studies show that the tighter the control, the better the control, the less complications you have in the eye. So I'm, gonna, I'm kind of hedging on the answer, but. Yes, you do. Yeah, talk to your primary care doctor or endocrinologist. And when you say it comes back, meaning the prescription has changed or his eyes are not yeah. as sharp at any particular distance. Yeah, so we, we talked about a few reasons why the prescription can change. Typically LASIK, the effect doesn't just go away, but other things inside the eye change, whether it's development or cataract or uh, swelling in the back of the eye like Dr. Meta showed, um, but other parts of the eye can be affected, which can effectively negate what he had done, but, but usually the LASIK itself doesn't go away. Yeah. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else? Other than controlling your sugars, is there anything else that diabetic can do? Yeah, one of the biggest things you can do is just have your eyes checked frequently. So, you know, if, if we get to a problem early, then whether it's laser injections or just counseling you to, you know, something's got to change, we can head off problems down the road. But, but oftentimes, if it's been years and years and years, it's hard to reverse changes and problems once they've been there too long. We, we don't like to test it with a contact lens on. Technically, you can in certain ways, but most commonly, we'd have you take your contact lens off and then and test for higher accuracy. Well, thank you very much for coming. It's been fun for uh, Dr. Med and myself to have a chance to talk to you all. And, and certainly, if you have any questions, we're happy to answer those afterwards as well. So thank you.